Foundation of Day Analysis. Let me adjust the lights here. Uh, spots. Uh, okay. I like the edge. Okay, these are not labeled correctly. Okay. Um, um, so, how's this? Can you all still, is there enough light in the room? That's too much. Uh, so the edges are supposed to be working, they're not working, but uh, that's too much. Uh, so okay, we'll try this. So I, I um um so this is so um so foundations of of um so this is foundations of the analysis. And um, so it's uh, um, so this says uh, so CS or so DS thirty one ninety or there's a comp fifty nine sixty um, so listing the reasons why all these things are complicated. This is an elective for the computer science degree. It's also a required course for the new data science degree. Um, so um, so the um, so the purpose of today's course is going to be to try and give you, you an, uh, an kind of the mechanisms of how the course will work, and then we'll go into an overview of what we'll be covering for the whole semester. Um, so, um, so hopefully this will kind of <laughs> give you a sense and a preview of what we'll be talking about. And if you're still trying to make a decision if this course is right for you, um, so, um, so hopefully this will give you the right ideas. Um, so this is going to be an in-person class. That means it's here in so this room for all of you here. I'm also live streaming this on Zoom and is um, so going up to YouTube. Um, so it, it's going to be recorded on YouTube. The videos will be up there. I've done this for a number of years. The, the classrooms on campus are open to the public. So this is a public space. Um, but if there's some part of your reflection gets on here, I'm, I'm happy to try and take it down if you want that, but this is a public space. And so it'll mostly be recording my voice. And if there are questions, I'll just try and repeat them. Um, so that's good because if this class, if we have to go into quarantine mode or something like that, um, or if you do the classes, the, everything will be, is so still going to be online. Um, and we can transition kind of into the Zoom, um, back to the Zoom classes again. Um, so hopefully we don't have to do that. It's been quite a while since I've been back in the classroom. I'm very excited to be here. So I hope we get to stay here the whole semester. Um, so, okay, so, so part of the reason, I guess the screen is this shape, which is a little bit more narrow, is that I'm actually the, the setup I'm doing is I'm simultaneously sharing my screen on Zoom. Um, and if you're on Zoom, there should be a TA in the chat. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll try and monitor these. It's a bit harder with doing the hybrid, um, but um, so, um, so oh, um, hopefully this will work. Um, great, that was a test of something. Okay, so don't go on Zoom during class. You'll get some feedback. Um, so great. Um, so okay. So um, so um, yeah. Before we go over the mechanisms, I want to start by looking at um, yeah. So I just want to talk for a little bit about so masks and vaccines. Um, so I I 
So I think these are very important. So, you know, a lot of us thought in the summer and there were a bunch of kind of stuff decided of what we should do for this semester. In, in the middle of the summer, things seem to be looking good. Then the Delta variant started spreading and it's um, so spreading in Utah. The numbers look much worse elsewhere. This is the numbers in Utah of the, of the case counts. Um, testing is not as high as it was. So these case counts um, um, might be lower than the actual, actual number. But if you see the hospitalizations in the bottom of the middle here, these hospitalizations are up nearly as high as where they were in the worst part of the pandemic. Um, and, and so these are a precursor of the deaths. The deaths are creeping back up. Okay, so um, we are not out of this yet. We still need to be careful. Um, so, um, okay, so these are hospitalizations within Utah. So the hospitalizations within Utah are coming up again. There are places that have already started back to school a couple of weeks ago and don't have quite have the kind of the requirements that that um, even looser requirements than we have here. And it's much it's um, so much worse. Um, but the uh, so one thing I like about this graphic is it breaks it down by the age groups and you can see that. Um, even after a bunch of people have been vaccinated, there are still, um, in the upper age groups, there's still an increasing number of these hospitalizations. So I don't like this much, but this is, is the fact. And the last week or so, it looks like it might be going back down. That data has not been um, totally tabulated yet. So I would not get excited about that decrease at the end there. Um, so, um, so vaccines are, this um, amazing piece of science, these mRNA vaccines have just been totally amazing breakthrough. 80, at least 83% of faculty and 70% of students have been vaccinated. I think these numbers are okay. In fact, I think these are undercounts. I've heard where they got these from is by, they have access by default to some people's medical records. They're like in my chart or something. And the vaccinations in there is what they're tabulating. I know of people whose vaccinations are not in there. And so I believe these are undercounts. So I'm okay with these numbers. I'd like to be higher. 55% of all residents of Utah have had at least one dose and 71% of people 18 and up. We're one of the youngest states, right? So in the country or the youngest state, I think. So, um, so kind of it's, <laughs> it's good to look at this by, by so age group. Um, so, so I hope all of you are vaccinated. In fact, something very excited finally happened yesterday. The FDA did a formal approval of the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna one probably is, is, is coming soon. This is a, a process that normally takes longer and they've been expediting it because, well, half of the population has had the vaccine and there's a very preponderance of evidence that one, these are extremely effective and they're extremely safe. Okay, there are some minor risks involved, but much less than a lot of other things you, um, um, so you typically do, and probably your age group, you know, um, the risk of anything serious is, is very, very small. So, okay, so um, I expect the, the state of Utah has forbid having a mandate on vaccines under an emergency use authorization of, the, uh, of these vaccines. As of yesterday, the Pfizer COVID vaccine is no longer an emergency use. It's now formally approved, just like you have measles and mumps vaccines that you have to have to come here. I expect the university soon will have a requirement for vaccines. I don't know if that will be some point during the semester or for the start of the next semester. That's my expectation. I recommend if you haven't gotten one, you go and get one right away. Um, there are places on campus you can get one. I posted some links, I think, on the syllabus, and I'll mention some a bit later as well here. Um, so these vaccines are extremely effective. I want to point out a couple of numbers here. This is from a recent discussion on a study in Israel um, where a large portion of the population has, has so gotten the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna one is very similar in how it works, and 90 roughly percent of the vaccines given in the US have been one of these two vaccines. If you look at all age groups at the effectiveness, it says like 67% effective of, of so preventing these 
so severe disease. That means that a people not vaxxed, about out of 100 people, about 16 or 16 will be in the hospital. We're only five percent if you've been fully vaxxed. Okay, so that's a kind of a three a factor three improvement. You're um, three times as likely to go to the hospital if you get infected if you um, if you don't have the vaccine. Okay, but this number is too low. It's much more effective than this. If you do a simple decomposition in eight groups by below 15 or above 50, what you'll see is that it's closer to a factor 10 increase, right? From 3%, um, 0.3% if you're fully vaccinated, that's a very low percentage under 50. Assume probably everyone here is under 50, so that's great for the vaccine, but four out of, out of 100 um, K will go um, here. So that's about a factor of 10 and a similar for the higher age. Notes for above 50 is still pretty close to the overall average of 13 out of 100 K. So if you look at the average person, the population, the probability that they would get a severe case is still kind of um, still higher than what we would like it to be. Okay, but the improvement is again a factor of about 10. Okay, this is a loose breakdown between 50 and above 50, but it actually is more extreme as you break it down into smaller categories. You went back before um, with those other plots, the, um, the younger you are, the more effective it is, the older you are, the less effective everything is. And so I believe it's actually about a factor 20 if you break it down by age groups even further. Okay, so these are extremely effective vaccines. FDA approved them, they're extremely safe. Okay, I recommend, highly recommend you get one if you haven't gotten one already. You'll probably have to get one to be here in the spring anyways, or at some point later in the semester. Um, so, okay, vaccines do help slow the spread. Okay, there have been a couple of, um, so some slight confusion on this. Let me see, there was something in the chat. Um, there's been some small confusion about whether they do really slow the spread. There was some, there's one case study, which I think was um, abnormal for a number of reasons, where it was, um, where it was, uh, it was, it was, they said maybe they spread there. You can, if you are vaccinated and you're infected, you're equally likely to kind of, um, to spread COVID. Um, it, th this is a recent study. Um, it has not been fully published yet, but it's on like some uh, preprint repository that shows over a, um, a big, I think this is from a Singapore airport outbreak. And they showed that the unvaccinated people have a much lower um, so viral load. The viral load is kind of how much virus you have kind of floating around your nasal cavity. Typically it could be elsewhere, but the nasal cavity is where you're well, spreading it, where you're, um, when you're breathing out. And this is on a log scale. So this is kind of the unvaccinated people, it's a cumulative density plot. So the probability that you have less than a viral load of say six, I don't know what these numbers mean, but kind of look at the relative sense, this gets up to 80%, where the 80% is up to 7.5 here. And it's on a log scale. So it's a pretty big difference here. You have a lot less viral load if you're vaccinated. And so that means you're, when you're breathing out, you're going to be spreading a lot less of the virus with you. Okay, so if you're vaccinated, you're much more likely you're going to have a lower um, so viral load, and you're going to be much less um, kind of chance of infecting other people. Okay, so again, the, the vaccines seem like a pretty good idea here. Um, let's see, are the exams online or in person? Um, yeah, I'll I'll get to that in a bit. Um, okay. Um, so, okay, so these masks work. Um, I don't, I, I don't know how accurate this the other stuff. I'm pretty confident about the accuracy of because it's an interesting graphic. But masks prevent a lot of particles from getting out of your mouth um, and spreading onto other people. Um, what's kind of disgusting? Um, but seeing these graphics of stuff like this, I think they're kind of maybe a little bit exaggerated here about what's going on here. There's some kind of chart that's in um, some very small scale here. But um, the mask prevent 
the same sort of particles which are spreading COVID from getting out on, onto other people. You want it to be tight fitting around your face. Um, and they give you some protection as well. Um, if you have a K95, and these are a bit warmer to wear, a few of you have these, which are great. Um, these will protect you from bringing those particles in a lot more, but it's really the mask that's prevent your, it's to help your classmates from getting infected. Okay, and so it's a courtesy to other people. Um, and so I recommend everyone, everyone to wear a mask. You often may not know if you are positive for COVID until um, after you've been uh, contagious for a few days. Okay, and so it's very unpleasant to have COVID. You would not want to spread this to any of your any of your classmates. Um, okay, despite vaccines, there's still people who are vulnerable. There's people who are immunocompromised. I've got there's there's someone on the faculty I know whose spouse is it is is immunocompromised. And they've done a test after they were vaccinated. They got some um, checked for um, because they're immunocompromised. They weren't able to retain the 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 white kind of the whatever's going on the vaccine that protects them. And th they did a test, and they had lost the power to fight COVID, even though they were vaccinated. Um, so unvaccinated people who are even vaccinated people who are immunocompromised are still potentially at very high risk. Um, people over sixty five are still at this elevated risk. Um, and children, the, the cases of children getting COVID is usually much, so much less severe, although there I've heard about in some of the southern states with the big outbreaks, the children's ICUs are completely full. Um, and when ICUs get full, it just screws everything else up. Um, and they're going to be in a bunch of clouded classrooms. It's the first day of school for Salt Lake City School District. And so um, they're going to be able to spread this a lot, and I don't want their their classes to be canceled and interrupt their learning. Um, so, okay, so I have people living in my household in two of these categories, and I would not like to have to quarantine and kind of put these, these people at risk, okay? Um, so I am vaccinated. I am not particularly worried about my own health, but I'm worried about spreading to other people. I'm gonna wear a mask while I lecture. I feel I can speak fairly loudly and you can still hear me hopefully okay. I feel this is, I'm probably one of the big kind of potential vectors of spreading it. If I get sick and I'm not wearing a mask, I'm gonna be projecting stuff out towards the classroom. Um, so I will keep wearing a mask with the lecture. It seems to be working okay so far. Um, okay. And then, okay, so finally, the University of Utah's guidance on this is to, they highly suggest you get vaccinated. This is the based on the CDC recommendation. There are a bunch of places where you can find these are on the syllabus as well, where you can figure out um, how to get vaccinations. They're free. It's a very good deal. Much cheaper than paying for a fake vaccination card. Um, it comes with a vaccination card for free. Um, okay, if you're not vaccinated yet, you are expected to get weekly asymptotic um, um, asymptomatic tests. Um, those aren't so painful. I would recommend going doing it pretty easy to do. It's much easier to get vaccinated. I recommend getting vaccinated. Um, I would, um, we're going to follow the CDC guidelines and regarding, um, um, so face mask, especially indoors. Okay. The transmission outdoors with COVID is much, much more rare. The only cases I've kind of heard of is two people running a marathon right next to each other and, and uh, people eating directly across from each other in very close quarters. Um, so especially when we're inside a room, I don't know quite how good the ventilation is in here. It looks like it has some ventilation, um, but we're in here for an hour and a half together. I'd recommend masks. And as being a, you know, as being leaders of this university, as the faculty, I'm gonna model that and wear a mask as, as in all of these um, sort, of, sort of situations. Okay, so I, I hope I just wanted to start with kind of what I believe is a fact-based kind of um, guidance-based view of the mask and COVID situation. Um, and so if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to take any questions or discussions. So great, great. So, okay, good, good. So I just wanna get that out of the way. I hope uh, they keep seeing a lot of you wearing some masks in here. Um, so, so, okay. 
Um, let's get on to the stuff in the class. Um, okay, so I am, I am, uh, uh, so I'm Jeff Phillips. I'm the instructor of the class. I have taught this class. I think this is the fifth year I've taught it. I, I developed this class because we were seeing a lot of students in the upper level data mining machine learning classes that weren't undergrads weren't some were doing great some were not quite prepared and so we wanted to kind of make sure they were prepared and kind of fill a gap in knowledge here it's also kind of an introductory sort of machine learning and data analysis course um i have written a book over the years of so developing this course um i'm i'm showing off mostly because i'm pretty excited this is the first semester i'm teaching where after the book has actually been published, it took a long time to get everything working. There's a free version online. The free version is not quite as polished as this one. There are a few typos. There are some problem sets, a few more examples in here. Um, but the one online is workable. So I'm not, I'm not someone who's going to require that you buy my book. Um, so, but you're, you're, um, so you're welcome to buy it. Look for the cheapest price you can you can find. Amazon sometimes has cheaper prices than the publisher. Um, so okay, um, so there's there's a link to the book someplace on the page as well. We have four great TAs um, for the class. Um, so, um, so let's see. Uh, I wonder if they're on Zoom and they might be willing to jump in and say hi. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm one of the CA, I'm not in die, and my office hour will be every Monday, 7 to 9 p.m. on Zoom. You're welcome to yeah, ask me questions at that time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so great. Um, so how Cheng, um, so so, so his uh, his office hours, I scheduled them in the evenings. I figure um, now that people are more comfortable in Zoom, we'll have at least one set of Zoom office hours. And I think this is kind of a different time frame, and it might be better for some people. So we're going to try this out. Um, our, our, uh, Peter, Ian, or someone else? Oh, great. So I'm Ian. Uh, my office hours are obviously Monday in the afternoon. Um, great. And is Peter or a manager around? Uh, hi, Professor. I'm Manoj. Great. So you will probably... Um, um, so see them at some point. So I have, oh, great. So here is Minaj. Great. Let's make this big so you can, I don't know if you'll be able to hear him, but you can wave. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm not sure if the audio is working. Is the audio working on Zoom? Yeah, yeah it's working. Yeah, okay. But you can, you can hear him. I think I turned mine off so I don't get feedback. Um, so, okay, great. Um, so, and then Peter, well, you know, <laughs> we're doing okay for hybrid, I think, on the first day. Um, okay, it's not, not perfect, but um, okay. And then, and then Peter has uh, teed this class before as well. So he's going to kind of, um, he's quite knowledgeable about this. Um, and I've, I've scheduled the times of the office hours for, for, for all of them. Um, if there are, if there are no times that work well for you, um, please let me know now, not towards, towards the end of the end of the semester. That's much less effective than now. Um, I've, I've booked a room for all of them and I was not sure how many of you would want an, um, a, a, um, let's see, a, uh, a, an office hour either in person or on zoom. So I didn't kind of do the, and I'll decide that based on the demand. I have booked a room that is, if you know where the main office for the school of computing is, and then there's some bathrooms in a little hallway next to that, there's, there's a room in there that can sit about 20 people um, if it's packed, okay? But if you have five or six people in there, it won't feel too crowded. It has a whiteboard and it has a vent. So I think there's some ventilation. Um, so kind of giving you a sense, I, I kind of want to get your feedback on whether you want in-person or Zoom office hours. We will do a show of hands here and uh, let's see if I can um, also, you can do a show of hands. Who wants in-person office hours? Okay, and who would rather have Zoom office hours? 
Okay, okay. So it's about a quarter, maybe a quarter to a third on Zoom ones. Okay, so so probably what we'll do here is I will put, um, okay, I'm, I, will, I will have at least two of these to be in-person office hours. Um, and maybe the maybe the third one as as well um okay so i will i I, um i will post some information about that i told the ds not to hold office hours this week because there's probably not too much to discuss with um okay you've noticed they're all monday and tuesdays the reason for this is the homeworks in the class which are not every week but they will be due um tuesday nights okay they'll always be due um so tuesday at, at, at midnight and i know how how, how you guys are, you want the office hours typically right before the homework is due. Um, the, you know, the office hours, the homework will be posted at least uh, a week, probably usually two weeks in, in advance of it being due. So you don't need to wait till the last minute and you can ask questions on Canvas as, as well. Um, but this is when there's the most demand for office hours. Um, my office hours are going to be directly after class Either here, or we might go out in the, in the in the courtyard outside here, and then I'm going to have also some. I'll start them off as Zoom office hours on Friday at so nine to ten. Um, the the TAs are going to be much more helpful with the homework. I will do that too, but I figure often when people come to office hours, they have other sorts of questions, and and so I I schedule those in off the peak hour so we can address those other sorts of issues that are are. So coming up. Um, so okay, um, most of the communication for the class will be through this web page and through Canvas. Okay, we're not doing one of those. Uh, there's like Piazza and some other stuff. That, I think the Canvas one works fine for me. I kind of used it in a as a power user last spring and kind of was pretty, pretty happy with it. So um, so okay. So let's see. Um, what's yeah? So I will. I will get this up and I will put a Google calendar of all the office hours and stuff so you can, can find all that. Um, as I mentioned, this is also gonna be on Zoom and YouTube. You can find the links up at the, at the, at the top here in case you can't come to campus or you're, um, so, so you're, you're, you're running late or something like that. That is always an option. Um, so the yeah, this is just a welcome video. I'll take this down in a um, in a in a week or so. Um, okay, I know I'm posting the videos online. You feel like you can watch them later. The number one correlation with success in this class is attending the lectures the week that they're 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 kind of given. Right, either in person, that's great, or watch them on Zoom, or if you're busy, watch them on YouTube that night. Don't delay watching them. You can we can watch them at 1.5 speed on YouTube. That's fine. Um, but please watch them. It will really help you. It covers the material. We'll be tested on. You'll be learning about. And if you fall behind, it's structured in a linear way so that we build on stuff throughout the semester. So try not try not to fall behind and try to stay keep keeping up with class. Um, hopefully, I'll try and keep it keep it fun and entertaining. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's come back to the syllabus a little bit. Um, okay, so I already mentioned this class is about kind of the introduction to data analysis is kind of filling a gap between what you may have learned in a intro prop stats class and a linear algebra class where you're learning a lot of more technical details about those things and how to use those ideas for machine learning and data mining. Okay, it's kind of filling in that gap. Um, those classes that start to do a bit better from when I started teaching this class of thinking about kind of th these mathematics in those, in the kind of applying them on, um, uh -huh, applying those onto data. Um, but, but we will kind of really um, work, work through that in, in detail. I got into data analysis and data science from a computational geometry background. And so I think very visually. And so I will be trying to communicate a lot of what we're learning in this, in this semester through kind of figures and images. And I hope it's a very intuitive view of what's going on that will be coupled with 
the formal mathematical notation for things, okay? That is for two reasons why this is really important. One, if you're going to be doing any machine learning or data science stuff in your career, this is a very quickly evolving field and you'll probably need to kind of look stuff up on Wikipedia or in a research paper. And this is the language that stuff is written in. If you don't understand how to interpret this mathematical language, you won't know what's going on in those papers. Okay, so, um, so um, okay, great. Um, and uh, so, um, the, so, so the second reason is that this mathematical notation is there for a reason that they didn't just randomly decide they're gonna write stuff in this kind of linear algebra formulation. It's because it makes it really convenient and precise. And once you get it, much easier to understand what's going on. It's not that complicated. It's a language just like a cool programming language allows you to kind of a cool library, allows you to code something up much quicker. This mathematical language allows you to describe what's going on very concisely in some way. And so we will use that. And by the end of the semester, it'll be natural for you. And it will no longer be intimidating if this is intimidating. And if you love this sort of stuff, you're going to see a lot of kind of really cool things in this area as well. Okay. Um, we will use Python in the, in the class um, as the main programming language. This is mainly not a programming class. Okay. We will do some stuff, but mainly to illustrate concepts to show you Look, here's a data set. It's very easy what we're doing. Um, so it'll be simple demos so you feel comfortable doing it. We're gonna use, um, so like these Jupyter notebooks using, I'm gonna show everything in, so Google Colab. So everything is shared online. You can get all the code. We'll walk through some simple things in class and you'll have to do a little bit of programming for some of the assignments, but it should mostly be pretty simple extensions of what I'm doing just to force you to get familiar with it. Okay, um, so, okay, um, there's a tutorial posted here from one of my TAs from last year and uh, kind of helps you with all the basics, but it's pretty easy to, to kind of, um, should be pretty easy to pick up, even if you have no Python background. When I first started teaching this, almost no students had any Python experience. Um, let's see a show of hands. Who's used any Python before? Yes. Okay. So most of you are, but not, but not everyone, and that's fine. Okay. At this point, people have used Python before they've got here. If you have, um, there's this great class some people don't know about, um, DS2500 called Data Wrangling. It's It should not be a hugely challenging class, but should really give you a background on how to do all the cool stuff with Python, load data, get it ready, and think about kind of data science problems, part required for the data science degree. Um, that class will be a lot more about how do I really get into doing stuff the right way with data processing with, with Python. That is not what we're doing in this class. Um, okay, here's a link to the book. Um, you can find some other resources on there, um, videos. Um, okay, great. Let's jump to the syllabus. Um, uh, okay, and so this syllabus has all this information on there expected learning outcomes. We kind of went over that already. Um, okay, so getting help. If you're struggling, please ask me, or if you're just question about what's going on, uh, the, myself, the TAs and their office hours um, on, so um, post questions on, um, so Canvas, will be trying to use the discussion boards on there. Um, that will be the great, if you have a general question, please post it there. That'll save us the time of answering the same question. 10 times over email, um, but don't post potential solutions on, on, uh, on, on Canvas. I'll have to take those down and that won't be helpful. Um, the first one's a warning, so don't worry. You know, Feel free to post and then if you go over, I'll give you a warning, um, um, so no big deal. I'd rather people are posting lots of questions on there. I'm usually pretty quick at answering them. Um, so that's a, that's a great way to do it. And I might be quicker to respond to a Canvas question than I would be to a direct email. Okay, um, prerequisites. These are kind of loose. People come from all over, but we do expect, you know, just some, I, I don't want the programming to be a challenge. Um, so a lot of you are, should be CS or data science majors and that's fine. Um, kind of linear algebra, 
I had people, a lot of people to take it as a co-rec before, and they found some of this stuff challenging. We just went too fast. But the probability class can be a co-rec, you can take it at the same time. That's generally okay. We'll do the probability stuff first for about the first quarter of the class, and then the next three quarters will be more linear algebra focused with some probability mixed in. Um, grading is this standard scale. Okay, the late policy. Homeworks will be due at 11.50 p.m. on Tuesday night. Canvas might give you a little grace period, but they're due at, at, at 11.50 p.m. Um, okay, and if you are late, you can turn it in late, but you will have, uh, you'll lose 10%, uh, the, like lose 10 points out of 100 on the, um, within the first 24 hours late and 20 points out of 100 on the second uh, 24 hours late. After that, it's gonna be too late. We'll, we'll, um, my TAs in the past have been pretty quick about grading the homework. So we're gonna get it back to you, hopefully pretty quickly. And I won't let you turn it in after we start kind of discussing solutions and so forth. Okay, so you have 48 hours uh, and th that means you, pr prevents you from um, um, so losing something, I think, uh, yeah. Oh, was there, I think you could drop, Oh, um, yeah, the lowest homework grade. Oh, I said it, you can drop the lowest homework grade, okay? But I want you to um, at least make an attempt. I don't want people to do the, to kind of just not do a homework because I think that prevents the, the learning. So as long as you make an attempt on all the homework, so I'll allow you to drop the lowest grade. If I see something that's basically not turned in or you really, didn't do it, then I'm you're gonna use that grade, okay? But otherwise I'll drop the lowest grade of the homework, okay? Um, okay, and collaboration policy, feel free to discuss with other people, um, but you must write your own code proof and the write-ups, okay? Um, cheating is no good, it's gonna ruin your career. There's a two strikes policy, you'll be out of the major if you get caught cheating twice in school computing courses, that's computer science or in so data science. Please don't do it. Um, it's better if you're struggling. And these last couple of years has been really difficult. I'm happy to make accommodations. That's much better than hopping an assignment and failing the course because you did that and getting dropping out of the major. Not a good idea to cheat. It's not worth it. I know when things get tough, that might be tempting. Come talk to me instead, okay? I will figure out a solution. I'd much, much rather do that than have to do that to reduce the temptation of cheating in this class or copying. And we have caught people in the past. I do, it's no fun for anyone involved. So please, please don't do that. Um, there's full policy on that that's linked off of here. Um, Okay, we offer support for students with disabilities. Uh, this happens almost every semester that, that someone needs a little bit extra. Feel free to ask that. Um, that's, that's, um, there's the proper channels through so CDS um, and kind of where there's a low tolerance for some misconduct of any form in the, in the classroom. Um, and if you have preferences and how should I should address you, please, please, please let me know. Um, and I will try and make this a um, inclusive sort of setting. Um, there'll be some interaction with you. You know, this is mostly in your inner wise interaction. If there's other discussions in class, that's also fine. Um, if you feel I'm not living up to this, please let me know and help me out. I am still trying my best and always learning um, new things. Um, and this has been a really tough couple of years. If you're feeling isolated um, or need to talk to someone or just dealing with the stress, contact the wellness. So um, center about that. And in my spring class, we had, it was on Zoom, but it was discussion based. And some people said they didn't really talk to anyone else during the week. Um, hopefully now that we're back, this is much easier, but if you go into lockdown, um, don't feel shy about reaching out about these resources. We are here to help. Okay, these are where the links are about the um, about information you can find. Follow this link on here. You can find all the other information um, that we talked about, ma mass. 
Um, I recommend the homeworks are done in using LaTeX. Um, I'm not as strong of a recommendation as I was a while ago, um, but at the same time, Overleaf has to make this so much easier to do. Um, so it's it allow you, a lot of this class is about learning how to use mathematical notations and make making sense of it. And, and LaTeX allows you to do that properly, uh, whereas other ways don't do it. Um, this is not strictly required. Um, like it's built into like Microsoft Word. You can type a little math equation, Microsoft Word. It's much more easier with certain plugins now than you could before. Um, you can do it in IPython notebooks even. They have built in um, LaTeX and math support. That is fine. If you want to do it by hand, um, some stuff you'll need to make plots, okay? Those, those you probably can't do by hand, but if you want to make something by hand uh, and then and then take a really nice picture and upload it, as long as we can read it and it's clear, it's okay, but if you do it sloppy, you might get marked off for that, okay? But I recommend Montec. Um, okay, um, great. So this is the syllabus. Let me just kind of walk through the schedule on how to read this part of the webpage. This is kind of important. Um, okay, so I've, I've got the whole schedule laid out on the web page here. This will really help navigate and see what's what's um, what's coming up. You know the the date. These correspond with the chapters in the book. It's usually just a few pages, so I recommend just reading the textbook. The lectures will follow the textbook fairly closely. They grew out of my own lecture notes from this course, right? So don't be surprised if it's close. But if you miss something, it will it will it will be in there. Help you reinforce what's going on. Some people really enjoyed reading it for like the five or ten minutes before class. They get an idea, and then they can ask the better questions during the actual actual lecture. Um, okay, here when I post videos on YouTube, I will change this slide to lowercase yt once it's posted, and then you'll see directly to the video on YouTube in case you want to watch at 1.5 or 2.0 speed. Oh, so who watches stuff at 1.5 lectures? Who goes higher 1.75, 2.0? Oh man, that breaks my brain. I can sometimes do 1.75, but 2.0 is too fast for me. Um, okay, I guess it depends on how fast the person's talking, right? If they're a really, they're a slow talker, maybe you can do it, but yeah. Okay, great. So those will be available. If you don't come to class, make sure you watch the videos. Yeah, question. Someone raised their hands in chat. What? Someone raised their oh. hands in chat. Oh, they did. Okay. Uh, are these, there's still a question? Please type in the chat. I've been kind of monitoring the chat on Zoom, um, sometimes not as quickly. I have my volume turned off. So the chat, let me see if I, oh gosh, it's a uh... question. Okay. What? Is there a, oh, oh, they did. <laughs> okay. Uh, are these, there's still a question? Please type in the chat. I've been kind of monitoring the chat on Zoom. <laughs> oh, that's me. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute this monitor. again. <laughs> I, I thought that was a TN. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, go ahead. The, those links are more important. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so I've not, that's because I've not connected anything to them yet. If you can find an old version of my class, you'll see what's there. But I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to create slides on my iPad. I'm going to write on the iPad like I would on a chalk or board or whiteboard during class. And in here, I'm going to upload those, those notes that I took during class. So you'll have those available as well. Okay. Um, and then, and then these all, there are also a few other links like to like collab. Um, this will be a link to some, um, some, a little bit of code that we go through. Those links should be active. Okay, and if you, if you cannot, uh, if, you, if you're so eager to them in other places, the book, um, if you go to the book's webpage, I've linked a bunch of the, those past slides um, off the book webpage and other places to find it. Okay, um, last column is the quizzes and the homeworks, okay, when, when it's colored, that's when you have the quiz, right? So, or, or when the homework is due, and I'll, this is when I guarantee the homework will be close to time. So I think you'll always have at least two weeks on each homework. Um, we have this one, I think it's ready, we're just checking it over, we're gonna post this pretty soon. 
Um, and it looks like there's a quiz tomorrow. Oh, not tomorrow. On on so Thursday, Thursday. There's a quiz on Thursday. Quiz zero. Okay. This quiz is worth I think a quarter of the other quizzes. It's just going to be on the syllabus. Okay. So go read this. Go read the syllabus. It should be pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, question. What's a reasonable amount of time to expect to spend? Um. Yeah, I think it varies on the homework and your background, right? The first homework, I, I, I will say some homeworks are harder and longer than others. The first one on is on probability. And if you recently took a probability course, it should be pretty quick. Okay, there are some questions on stuff that should be new to this class, but half of it should be on stuff from um, that you've had in a prior probability course. Right, the first two lectures are just going to be a review of kind of the, a two lectures condensed in a full probability course. Okay, um, and so part of the homework's on those. The other, some of it's new, and you'll need to think a little bit. But I, I would say that one, on average, I'm guessing a couple hours. Okay. Um, however, I think it's I think it's homework. Homework three and four are gonna, I think are typically a bit more challenging. Okay, so um, don't be lulled into, uh, the first homework might be really easy for you. The second one is be about linear algebra review mostly and some new stuff there might not be too hard. The third and the fourth one are gonna be a little bit more time consuming. And I think I'm gonna have some, I typically will have some parts where you can go a bit beyond what is the minimum required there as well to kind of do some more, kind of explore stuff a bit more. Um, so those might take a few, like several hours and where several depends on, you know, if you get, get, get stuck on it or not. And, you know, it varies widely if you feel you're, if you feel you're able to accomplish it, you know, it should be fine if it takes you a little bit longer or less, how detail oriented you are in the write up, all these things, things, things vary. Um, the, so, so hopefully I don't, I don't think it's too bad. I meant to be kind of, if you've taken the CS 3130, the prop stats class, probably a little bit more and more challenging than that, but it's meant to kind of come after that as well. Okay. So give you, a, so it's similar in that cell. There are kind of problem sets, but it should not be as probably as challenging as like the, the algorithms class sort of problem sets. Okay. Um, okay, the quizzes, the quizzes are going to be um, decided because I'm, there's a lot of uncertainty about the Delta variant, we are going to do them as so canvas quizzes. Okay, I've had them in class in the past, we're going to do them on canvas. And I'm not quite, I, I did canvas quizzes in the, the last time I taught this class, and I think it mostly worked fine. I think we, um, I'm going to on the days we have quizzes, we're going to end the class a little bit early so you can finish the quiz during the class time. That's how it was meant to be. Um, and they'll be open on Canvas opening, I think at, uh, I think they open at like, uh, let's see, at like 1140 or something like that. So on the day of, of the quiz, and then they're going to close at like midnight and you have like a half an hour window to do them. They should probably take, and I think I aim for like the median student to take 10 to 15 minutes on, okay? The, um, so they're not meant to be challenging. They're meant to be, if you're paying attention to course and you're keeping up with the material, it should be pretty straightforward. It's kind of a, a mechanism to force you to keep up with class. That's the point of the quiz. Um, they're part of your grade as well, so you have to do them. Uh, they're not meant to be too hard. Um, and if, if there's something a lot of people get wrong, it means that I didn't cover the material properly or I messed, the question was too confusing. Okay, so I expect the scores to be pretty high in the quizzes. That's my, my hope and expectation. And I've met that in the past. Um, okay, the first one will be even shorter. Okay, the first one is just gonna be, go back and read the syllabus before the quiz. Um, okay, the quizzes are, going to be uh they're, they're going to be most kind of not quite i mean most 
mostly open book. Okay, so you can use resources. You can use, you can search for stuff directly on the web page. I don't want you trying to Google to see if you found the question somewhere else before, but directly linked off this web page or the book is fine to use on the quizzes. Um, and, and what I'd done when they were in person was not have an open book, but to like online, you, you know, you can't, unless you use some of this like spy, spyware software, you can't enforce, you don't do open book stuff. So I'm not gonna try and do that. Um, but in the past, when they were in person, I let everyone bring in one sheet of paper with one side on it. Um, so, and I'm gonna continue doing that and I'm gonna give you kind of bonus points if you turn that in and upload it. So you make a cheat sheet um, um, so that kind of forces you to kind of summarize what you learned the last couple of weeks on a piece of paper. And if you upload this, you can earn, I think five points towards the quiz, but you can't go over a hundred percent. Okay, so if you already get 100% without the cheat sheet, you don't need to upload it. Of course, you don't know how well you'll do until you've uh, submitted the quiz, um, but so, um, but allow you to make up a bunch of points to incentivize you to do this. And then on the final, you'll get to use six of these cheat sheets all together um, on the final. So they can be the ones you use for the quizzes or you can update them if you want to. Okay, I figured, I found that was an effective mechanism for students who retain the knowledge and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm adding this in there. Okay. Um, they will, the downside of the Canvas quizzes is, well, it's, you know, if you're in class, it's a little bit more of a, a pain. It's easier for you to write on a piece of paper. Um, two, if you're not in class, there's, there's other mechanisms for cheating on these, on these quizzes. You can sit next to someone else and do it. And I'm not going to use one of these spywares to, to because of a bunch of problematic issues with them. So please, so first I'll just say, please don't cheat on these. Okay. Um, you're ruining it for other people. I know some people dislike this situation because they are not cheating and they don't want their other people to have higher grades. That's the main downside of doing this. I felt I could not force people to come into, into class at the same point. Yes. It will, we will, you know, some of them will be multiple choice. Some of them will be empty kind of space sheet or kind of write something. Um, we've realized it takes you a long time to write mathematics in the Canvas interface. So we will do our best to keep what you're supposed to write down the mathematics on the quizzes um, as minimal as possible you'll get a chance to practice writing mathematics in the Canvas interface and the quiz zero, um, actually. Um, it's, it's a Canvas quiz. So if you've had a Canvas quiz in other classes, there are some variations on them. Um, if you wanna turn in a scratch paper, you can upload it with your cheat sheet if, you would, if you'd like to do that. Um, the question should be designed so we can, we know, you know, it's not, it's meant to kind of be, if you're following along, you should be able to get all the questions right. Okay, so it's, it's not something where we hope we don't have to give partial credit because you're getting it all right, um, but we will attempt to do partial credit if we can determine there's been kind of a common misunderstanding, which we feel is not reflective of the points loss. And we've done this and we did this last year. Okay, um, so we will, we will do our best to grade in a fair way. Um, I, I have a good number of TAs th this semester, so I feel we should have the, the kind of the manpower to be able to kind of do this, um, to kind of look over these carefully. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's like where the book is like actually like, it's they get all of the stuff right, it's all work right. Yeah, you know, that's, that's possible. Um, you know, hopefully if it's an outlier, it won't affect your grade. Right? That's one of the things we'll kind of talk about through the semester. If it happens once, you know, probably won't affect your ultimate grade. If it happens on every single quiz, then that's probably something else. So, um, okay, great. And if you do, you know, for whatever reason, you have trouble taking these quizzes, we can talk to CDS and we can figure out on another mechanism to make this work. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, good. So, so the first quiz will be um, on Tuesday. We'll see how this goes. If it's 
this disaster will will rearrange what we're doing, and uh, um, and hopefully we'll keep uh, the quiz and the final. The plan is to have the final also be um, able to be taken as a Canvas quiz. If things get a lot better, right? Everyone's vaccinated. The, 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 this kind of uh, thing with Delta kind of um, it fickles out. By the end of the semester, like requirements are down, I may move to an in-person quiz. If you are remote and this was the one thing holding you up, I would allow you to take it at a at a testing center someplace. Okay, so if if that's the one, if it's just the final, we'll figure out how to make that work. Okay, um, but that's that's the current plan with things. Um, so okay, um, okay. Let me just mention briefly the overall plan for what the, we'll cover this semester. Again, the first two lectures starting on Thursday will be a review of a probability class. We'll do these really quickly, the whole class in like two lectures. Um, and then Bayes rule, which you probably, hopefully you saw in there as well, we'll spend about a lecture on Bayes rule, but get into apply it to getting um, maximum likelihood estimates. Okay, how do we turn that around? How do we use that to start thinking about Analyzing data um, that may have been in your probability class. If not, that's new, might be new. And then we'll talk about some Bayesian reasoning a little bit. How do we turn this into modeling data and taking a bunch of data um, and combine that to get a, um, a problem, um, a model which maximizes some, um, some, some likelihood function? Then we'll get a little bit more in probability on the notion of convergence through the central limit theorem. I will probably teach this completely differently than how a statistician or your stats class probably talked about the central limit there. And we'll talk about it in a way you can use. Statisticians love talking about asymptotics about things. We'll talk about, oh, I have 592 data points. What does that mean about how well I've converged to my answer? We'll talk about how to talk about how to formalize the notion of convergence in a probabilistic sense, which will be essential for understanding how most of the machine learning is, is thought about how well it actually works. Okay, then we'll jump into linear algebra. We'll do a linear algebra review, and this, then, this will take three lectures instead of four lectures. Okay, and hopefully my perspective on this is a bit different and geometric in, in comparison to how you may have taken a problem a prior linear algebra course. Um, so, um, and then, and, and this will really be the linear algebra will be really important because this is going to be the kind of the language we describe the rest of the class. In. Okay, so I'll make sure that the language we introduce in this class will be what's used throughout and is fairly consistent with how uh, modern papers are written. So you understand that. Now, not everyone uses the same notation, but I think it's fairly well aligned with that as well as I think is reasonable to do um, for what we're going to discuss. Um, we'll get into like linear regression and cost validation. Hopefully you've seen a little bit of linear regression before, um, but we'll go through this carefully and we'll make sure you're thinking about this in the right way. So you have the right intuition of what's going on and what you can use it for and how to make sense about it, how, to, how much to trust it. Um, talk about how to solve this. There's a very simple, effectively closed form algorithm. Um, and then we'll say, well, that's not how people typically solve linear regression in machine learning settings. They use gradient descent. Gradient descent is the workhorse of most of machine learning. Um, you may have seen it before. We will formally talk about this and put this in context, and we'll see how to solve linear regression with it get into the stochastic gradient descent, which is what everyone uses nowadays. There's, there can be, there's a whole course in optimization in grad course in the math department on gradient descent. We're gonna do three lectures on it, okay? Um, we'll talk about, um, then get into dimensionality reduction. Um, the simplest version of, of this, when you have very, very high dimensional data and what it means of high dimensional data will make sense when we get through the linear algebra section um, and how you reduce the dimensionality while keeping um, the, the kind of um, the functionality of that. Again, we will talk about the simple algorithm for doing this called the power method. It's a really cool, cute algorithm. I think you will like it. Um, then we'll talk about um, 
clustering, we'll focus on the most common clustering, k-means clustering, and the most common algorithm, Lloyd's algorithm for that. Okay. In each of these sections, you'll see this pattern where we introduce the, the concept of that a data analysis, how to think about it. Then we'll go through a really kind of simple and cute algorithm of how to solve it. So it's mixing this kind of mathematical notation and how to apply an algorithm towards solving it. Um, and finally, we'll get into classification. This is most commonly associated with machine learning. You have a bunch of data, you want to predict an outcome, um, kind of some binary outcome of that data. And we will eventually get into this and start mostly talk about these linear models with the perceptron algorithm, but we'll get a little bit into kernel and neural nets at the, at the end. Um, you will unfortunately not be experts in deep learning at the end of this course. We have other courses for that, but you will be able to understand um, a lot of the notation that is involved in that and what is going on and what it can do and how it relates to these other parts of data analysis and then class, other classifiers themselves. Okay. So um, this is kind of the overview of everything that's being going to be covered here. Yes. Do we have any assignments that we need to do a fall break? Um, let's let's see here. Homework three will be out before fall break and do the second Tuesday after fall break. Okay. So do you have to do it over fall break? Depends on how much else you have going on, right? I've tried not to make it. I put quiz three right before fall break. I tried my best here with the parameters of the schedule not to ruin a fall break. I like fall breaks too, so I understand. Yeah. The current plan is for it to be online. That, that, is, that, is, the, that is the current plan, um, but I mentioned things could change. Uh, if things get a lot better, I'd be willing to put it in person, but at this point, I'm not willing to force someone who maybe is immunocompromised to be in the classroom. Um, so, yep. How will the final exam look? Because we only, it seems like we only have one exam. There's no midterm. The quizzes are kind of more on the light side. So, like, is the exam going to be like crazy hard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the final exam will be a lot like, like four quizzes. You have two hours for the final exam instead of half an hour for each quiz. Um, there are six quizzes. Um, it will feel harder just because it's longer and it's the whole semesters of material as opposed to what we talked about the last two weeks. Um, but it's not, um, you know, it's going to be the same level of question that's on the quizzes. So you will feel comfortable with it. And that's another reason for continuing it to be online because it'll be the same sort of format that you're, you're going to be used to. Um, it will, it will feel harder just because it's, it's bigger and, and longer. Um, oh, another thing they'll see, the quizzes and the homeworks don't exactly align with each other, okay? The, the quizzes are every, almost every two weeks, right, um, on Thursdays. The quizzes will always be on Thursdays, homeworks due on Tuesdays. The homeworks are about every three weeks or so as a, instead. They, and, okay, hopefully that's, that's not too confusing. You're all, I mean, if you're in this class, you're all pretty smart. I'm sure you can figure it out, but and otherwise, if I don't say something, someone's going to say, wait, these don't align halfway through the semester. Okay. Um, um, great. Okay. So that's, uh, I, I thought I would say a little bit about and give you a sense of how the lectures will go. Um, where are we? Uh, great. Okay. So um, well, let me try and give a little bit of some of the techniques we'll be covering in, in the class. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, so mostly be my interface here. Okay. So I, I'm not going to quite, cause we talked about the max and vaccines for why I probably won't get through everything I hope to, but let's do this for about, um, we have about 15 minutes left in class. Okay. So, um, kind of the, the, the main, okay. So let's, Let's see, the, um, this class is about, so data, so data analysis. And we'll talk about some examples of where this data comes from, but we're mostly gonna be focusing on the cleanest, most easiest to understand versions of these things. 
We're not going to be doing a lot of dealing with messy data. Okay. And so we're going to be working through notation that's used to represent data after kind of after it's been cleaned. So after the data wrangling course, that's when you apply the stuff from, from this course. And, um, and so we'll think of data and I'll write it in some way like this. And I'll write it in notation that might look like this, okay? So I don't know if, if notation is confusing for you and I haven't explained it, please ask. Part of the point of class is to help you understand this, but this is a set notation. So I have data elements, X1, X2, up to Xn. The curly brackets means there are a set of objects. These are all from my data points. I have N of these data points and they're RD, okay? so. Um, RD means they are d-dimensional vectors. Let's see where I've got too many screens going on here. Okay, so um, that means that each xi is actually going to be a vector. It's a little confusing notation. Xi one, xi two, xi three up to xi d. So it's going to be a vector, a d-dimensional vector of this data. Okay. And we'll think about data in this way. And our goal is to come up with some model. And the way we're thinking about modeling in this class is that it's going to be some finding some pattern in the data. And what that pattern will be will get more complicated as we get through, through the semester. Um, so we're going to try and um, to, to basically learn a model. Um, about the, um, let's see, um, a model M from the data. The, the model allows us to either summarize the data or predict something about new data, okay? Um, okay, and an important thing when we get into the probability of the class is that we will assume that the data is gonna come from some underlying distribution. Okay, so, so this is going to be a distribution, a probability distribution, and we're going to assume that the model comes IID, that means um, independently and identically so distributed. That means we draw an independent, every data point we're gonna assume is an independent draw from some unknown distribution. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through many lectures at once in the last 50 minutes here. This should not all make sense. I'm just giving you a preview. This is all coming very quickly. That's that's okay. If, it, if, it, if you've seen some of this before, we'll see it in more depth and it will become really kind of solidified and intuitive by the end of this. Okay. Um, and so this independently and identically distributed is a key assumption that is kind of um, baked into every data analysis model. Okay, that that is is that at least we'll talk about on this class. There's stuff that goes beyond it, but that gets into like less than probably five percent of machine learning. Okay, so um, we're gonna think about these um, these data coming from this distribution, and we're often gonna represent it as a vector, and the vector will allow us to do things like to measure a distance between. Um, Let's let's do this differently. Let's see. Let's call this a distance d between x i and x j. We'll we'll be able to think about these um, these these um, data points as actually points, and then the distance might be like the straight line distance between them. So we'll measure this. This is called the Euclidean distance. Um, and, and kind of this will allow us to put in high dimensional space and all of these models, you can think about geometrically as living in some two dimension or high dimensional space. We'll often think about and use linear algebra to discuss what happens in high dimensions, um, but we will draw pictures in two dimensions because that's what the dimensionality of the screen is. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and so you'll be able to see some, some, some concepts in there. Um, these, okay, so um, when I think about a, um, um, okay, my Mac's running out of power. Okay, I need to bring a charger next lecture. Um, okay, 
if I run out of power before the end of class, uh, it's just a warning that, that uh, if you're on Zoom, that's, that might happen, but we're almost there, so you're okay. Um, it, it could be, these are attributes of a person, right? So XI might be a um, person, let's call that person, uh, so um, Joe, and then this could be the um, kind of the, the height, the, um, the weight, you know, the age. So these, this representation of a data point can measure these attributes of the person. And we'll talk about when this is okay and when this is, is not gonna be okay. Um, there are various things to consider here. Um, okay, um, I wanna say something else that's important is that most of the models we're going to consider, we're gonna look at things like finding um, the, um, the best model, we'll call this M star. The star indicates that it's the best one, right? That's what the star usually indicates. And this is gonna be something, and in this case, we're gonna say, um, let's say arg, often an arg min out of some space of models, you know, you could have um, some space of models. This is supposed to be kind of a space of models, right? So if we're doing linear regression or we're doing clustering, these are the space of all possible regression models or all possible clustering models I can do. Um, and so we're gonna find the one that's the best. And argmin means I'm gonna return them the choice and we'll review this again in a lecture, but we're gonna choose the one that, that is minimizing some function. And this function is almost always going to look like this um, over my set of data sum. And I'm gonna measure usually something like Xi minus M squared. Okay, where this is the model. In this case, I'm able to measure subtract the data point from the model. This may seem unintuitive. Uh, that'll be a slightly different different situation, but if the model is a single data point representative, I can subtract them. Um, think of their just values. Think of their just like this, I'm computing maybe the, the single value representing the height of everyone in the room. Okay, and all the data points are all the heights and the model is the some average or representative height. And I want to minimize typically the sum of over all the data points, the difference from the height squared. Okay, the sum of squared errors is going to show up throughout the whole course. This is, there are reasons why we're doing this. Um, one reason is that um, it's going to lead to simple, clean algorithms. Okay, the algorithms for the sum of squared errors are easier than if I just did the sum of the dis distances. The algorithms are easier. And that's true for more complex models than single point models as well. The second reason is that you can derive this model from, if you start with data and you assume Gaussian noise and you look at this through a Bayesian perspective, then it turns out that this is the right thing to do to minimize the sum of the squared distances. So we'll derive from looking at this from a Bayesian perspective, why we want to minimize the sum of the squared errors but then this will be the focus for the rest of the, all the, almost all the algorithms for the semester will look at this. A couple of times I'll mention why we might want to deviate from that. Um, and in later classes, you will actually deviate from that for certain reasons. But in this class, we'll mostly focus on these simple intuitive sum of squared error models. Okay. Okay, so sum of squared errors, sum of squared errors. Sometimes, they take a square root of the n, that's the root means, or and they take a one over the number of data points, that becomes the root mean squared error, but they're all basically gives you the same optimal model. Right? And then we'll this will be what we use for our modeling, our prediction, or our simplification of the data. That's the model that minimizes this will be the best one. Um, okay. Um, I want to also talk about, think about how to fit these, there are four kind of topics. Okay, there are four kind of topics that we are gonna cover in class. Um, one is clustering, one is 
So, um, um, so dimensionality reduction, okay? Um, one is classification and one is regression. Okay, and you can kind of think of them in this chart in that when I'm clustering or I'm classifying, my goal is going to be a set. Is it, did I win or did I lose a game? It, was it, um, did, um, did, I, did I succeed in making this business venture or did it fail? The contract wasn't signed. That's kind of classification. A clustering is when I just group things into these set. Um, and whereas dimensionality and, and regression does not have this outcome. The regression is trying to predict a value. The outcome here is a value sort of prediction instead. Um, I'm not breaking things in the set. Um, this, the classification and regression is when I have um, labels, and this is when I have no labels. So when I'm building the classification and regression models, I'm gonna have data points, these XIs I was showing before, and then I also have some outcomes, either a set value outcome, this person, this business deal I have data on was successful, and this one was not successful. This regression, I made so much money on it, the value, amount of money, a scalar value is the output. And so that's kind of the distinction between these two, but they both have labels that I can use to train a model to predict what the label will be on a new, on a new data point. Whereas with clustering and dimensional reduction, I do not have labels. So I'm just kind of finding the structure of the data. I'm just saying I've got a bunch of data points. Let me find a simplified view of that data set. I'm not trying to make prediction on something new necessarily. I'm just trying to find some nice structure of prediction here. So the, the, um, the no label part, this is also often called unsupervised. Um, um, so learning, and this one is called supervised. Um, and so if you have if you have kids, you know that when they're unsupervised, they can have a lot of fun, but they can get into trouble. When you're when they're supervised, they're kind of guided towards some goal and you can actually check them on it. And that will be the case here as well. We'll be able to use a technique called cross-validation, which is super important way of thinking about data analysis in the supervised setting that will not be available to us in the unsupervised setting. Okay, so we will be able to do cross um validation here and this will be super this cross validation will be super important for helping us figure out how well we're doing and assessing if what we're doing is working or not we're with plus three dimensional reduction we're just going to kind of have to guess based on the sum of squared errors and that may or may not actually be a good prediction of how well things are actually working um so great um Let's see, and then the final thing I guess I'll mention is that um, we will talk about um, gradient descent. This is kind of the workhorse of machine learning I mentioned. And that was like, if we go back to this formulation here and I look at this and I say that this is some sort of, um, or actually, this part here, this is going to be a function of M. Okay, so what we're gonna think about is having some space of models here, and we can think about this as just a real value. So it's just a real value space of models, and then there's gonna be some function F, and our goal is to find the minimum of this function that the point down here is going to be m star. Okay. And so what's going to be set up in some cases, we're going to be able to take a bunch. This function will be defined by data, be defined by the data have. In some cases, we're going to be able to do something and just do some closed form calculations and just automatically solve for this m star. And that'll be really cool. But other times, we're not going to be able to do that. Instead, we're going to do this gradient descent which is where you make a guess, you get the function value, you find the gradient, 
which is the direction of steepest ascent, and you walk in the other direction. That brings you down to the bottom, and I and I make a step, and I update. Um, I update my function. I make another step, and I go here. And this is an algorithm, and it's different, very different from like a sorting algorithm or a search binary search algorithm. But it's a very important algorithm, and we can understand when it will get very close, not necessarily all the way to the bottom, but very close to the bottom in a small number of steps. And that means we're going to find a model that's maybe very close to the optimal model um, in a small number of steps, and it'll be an efficient algorithm. And so we'll look at algorithms in this sense that are iteratively improving the model every step. And sometimes we formulate them with a cost function. Sometimes we skip kind of this insight here, like with the clustering approach. We won't actually write it down as like a Think about it with great descent thing, but we'll still iteratively be improving the model and they will eventually converge to a better and better model of the data. And this is a very different way for some computer scientists to think about um, algorithms and how to get to a goal that you want to get to. Um, and so, but this will be a different way of thinking about that we will be comfortable with by the end of the class. Okay, great. So this is pretty much all I wanted to cover. Um, if you have questions, please reach me. Um, and then there'll be a quiz on Canvas.